Hello, everyone. This is Grace Pai with Value Our Families. Um, and thank you so much for joining our webinar today in advance of our fly-in days next week in Washington, D.C. Um, we're really excited to have you joining us, um, whether you're joining our webinar live right now or whether you're watching it at home. Um, and we wanted to create this opportunity just to review some of the policy um, agenda items that we'll be lobbying on so that you all have a little bit more time to prepare in advance. Um, and we'll also be having trainings and workshops um, in person before we start lobbying in DC so that you can have a refresher and ask us any questions that you think of in between now and then. So the purpose of today's um, webinar is really to go over those policy pieces and also to share some tips on lobbying uh, on the Hill and how to advocate most effectively with um, congressional staffers whom we'll be meeting with um, over Wednesday and Thursday of next week. Um, so we'll just dive in and start by talking a little bit about the purpose of our fly-in days. So we have three primary goals. Our first goal is to influence members of Congress to support a forward-thinking vision to expand family-based immigration and prevent cuts to family immigration. Um, and so this has been a key purpose of the Value Our Families Coalition. Um, we both want to defend the system that we have because we know that it's come under attack both from President Trump with his recent um, immigration proposal from just a few weeks ago, um, but also from conservative members of Congress who have put forward um, different pieces of legislation over the last few years that um, cut family-based immigration or eliminate different categories of family sponsorship. Our second goal is to amplify public support for immigrants and refugees, especially family reunification. So we wanna get our narrative out there and to educate both members of Congress and their staff, but also the general public. And we'll do that through you know, various social media and traditional media tactics, um, but we really wanna make sure that, that our narrative and our values are, were, are at the center of the conversation about family-based immigration, but are also part of the broader um, media conversation around immigration issues more generally. And lastly, we want to mobilize advocates to take the skills that you've strengthened or developed during advocacy days back home to your districts during the August recess and beyond. So we'll all have the opportunity in August when our members of Congress are back in their home districts to follow up with them about commitments that they did or didn't make um, or to follow up with members that we didn't get a chance to meet with in DC. And so we really want to ensure that, that the days that we spend in DC are you know, not only just aimed, um, targeted at the work that we're doing while there, but that we're also equipping everybody with a set of skills um, that you can take back home to continue the advocacy because we know that this is something that we need to be talking about and organizing around year round. So I'll turn it over to Meredith Owen from Church World Service to talk a little bit about the different policy pieces um, that we'll be advocating around next week. Thank you so much, Grace. Hi, everyone. This is Meredith. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, each of the advocacy asks with an uh, emphasis on the Reuniting Families Act and ways we're going to be pushing Congress to strengthen family immigration, um, as well as talk through um, some talking points that can help shore up our asks. And you've probably already seen um, some of these if you've checked out the um, Congressional Ask document that Vivian included when she uh, provided some key information about the upcoming um, fly-in and advocacy days um, earlier this week. Um, so our three big bucket advocacy asks are, one, we want Congress to strengthen family immigration. We want Congress to protect refugee families. And we want Congress to protect vulnerable families and children through the FY 2020 budget process. Within that, um, we have specific uh, policy asks. Um, within each of those big bucket ideas. So within the ask for Congress to strengthen family immigration, we will be asking members of Congress to co-sponsor 
the Reuniting Families Act that preserves and strengthens the family-based immigration system. Uh, we want Congress to co-sponsor and support the No Federal Funds for Public Charge Act. Uh, to protect refugee families, we're going to be seeking co-sponsors for the GRACE Act and the No Ban Act. And then for protecting vulnerable families and children through the FY2020 budget, we're going to be asking Congress to cut funds that fuel immigration detention, uh, the deportation force, and uh, funds that further militarize our border, and to hold the Department of Homeland Security accountable for its, uh, its abuses. Next slide, please. So the, for the Advocacy Day and Fly-In, we are really focused on prioritizing um, the ask around strengthening family immigration and the Reuniting Families Act in particular. Um, and so if there was only ever one ask um, to be delivered in a meeting, um, the most important, highest priority is going to be talking through um, the Reuniting Families Act and why it's important that we strengthen family immigration um, and ask um, they're the senator or the representative um, to to co-sponsor the bill. Um, we I have provided in this slide um, the key provisions contained in the Reuniting Families Act. Um, the Reuniting Families Act is likely to be introduced the middle of next week, so it will coincide really well with with the fly-in. Um, and so we'll know by the time we get to the training on Wednesday night or Tuesday night and next Wednesday morning um, exactly where the bill is in terms of state of play. So right now what we have is a Reuniting Families Act bill summary um, that I'll talk through and then some supportive talking points that can um, offer some assistance if you're getting questions about it. So with that, um, the the important pieces to remember about the Reuniting Families Act is that, one, it clears the family-based and employment-based backlogs. Um, and it does that by recapturing unused visas. So it, that captures unused family-sponsored visas and employment-based visas um, for the time period of 1992 to 2015. Um, and then in the future, it takes unused visa numbers and rolls them over into the next fiscal year. Um, that is an important provision because from 1992 to 2009, there were more than 240,000 unused family-based visas and 506,000 unused employment-based visas. Um, and so it's important that we recapture the visas lost um, to help reunify families. It would also reclassify spouses, permanent partners, and minor children of green card holders as immediate relatives um, so that they're not subject to the annual limits um, that are imposed um, on these visa categories. Um, it also ends counting of derivatives um, toward these numerical caps. Um, and so what that means is that it prevents um, derivative visa recipients like spouses, permanent partners, children who are eligible to accompany or follow to join from being counted um, toward the categorical or per country caps. It also raises uh, those per country limits um, and addresses the decades long backlogs of people from certain countries by raising those caps from 7% to 20%. Um, and imposes a 10-year maximum wait time. So it provides that, a, that once a beneficiary has been waiting in line for 10 years, they're no longer subject to the per country or categorical visa caps. And then it also creates an exemption from the, visa, the family visa limit for certain sons and daughters of veterans from the Philippines. Um, in addition to that, this bill offers relief for those who are orphans, widows, um, and provides for equal treatment to all stepchildren. So it protects widows, widowers, and orphans by allowing them to continue to wait in line for a visa even after the death of a sponsoring relative. And then affords the same protection to the children of fiancés of U.S. citizens 
preventing them from aging out of the visa application process um, that other married immigrant visa holders have pursued. Um, and then it provides equal treatment for stepkids by allowing stepchildren under the age of 21 to be reca reclassified as immediate relatives. Um, beyond that, it provides greater enforcement relief to reunify and keep families together. So importantly, it repeals the three and 10 year bars as well as the permanent bar on admission for people who were un unlawfully present in the United States from adjusting to legal status and narrows um, the instances of inadmissibility or deportability for those who willfully misrepresent um, himself or herself to be a citizen of the United States. Um, so it would accept um, any immigrant under the age of 21 um, at the time of making willful misrepresentation. And then it increases the government's discretion and flexibility um, in waiving grounds of inadmissibility or deportability. Um, it also provides relief for spouses, permanent partners, and children on H-4 visas. Um, so it makes sure that they have work authorization, um, and it freezes the age of the child on the date the employment-based petition is filed so, they don't, so that kids don't age out. Um, it also eliminates discretion facing LGBTQ families, um, ensures retention of priority dates, and embraces the diversity visa program by increasing the diversity visa cap from 55,000 to 80,000 visas and no longer counting spouses and children um, accompanying or following to join um, under this cap. Um, it would also make it easier for certain um, uh, re refugee um, and asylees uh, to be able to follow to join um, their partners um, for those who are in same-sex partnerships. Um, next slide, please. So if you didn't memorize all of that, <laughs> um, I wanted to simplify it a little bit more. Um, the three big things that I would just want everyone to remember when they're going into these meetings is that we want you to say who you are, why you care, and what you want. So who you are. You are a constituent. You represent your community. Um, perhaps you have um, your own immigrant story. Why you care? Uh, why are you? Why did you come to D.C.? What has been the impact of family immigration on your family, on your community members? Um, this is where you can elaborate on a personal story. You can talk about the impact of low refugee arrivals to your family, your community, local businesses, um, local congregations, et cetera. And then what you want. So this is the ask. So the ask number one is to strengthen family immigration by co-sponsoring the Reuniting Families Act, to protect refugee families, and to protect vulnerable families and kids through the FY20 budget process. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of some sample talking points to talk about um, and shore up um, our Reuniting Families Act ask, um, we like to lead with sharing your family's immigration or refugee story. Um, we also invite you to talk about how the family unit is the cornerstone of every community and the basis of a values-driven immigration system, and that it's central to helping our communities thrive um, and achieve community wholeness. And then especially if you are a faith leader or you are a person of faith sharing that as faith communities, we know and recognize that every single family deserves stability and security and to live free of fear. Um, and America needs immigration policies that reflect these values, that strengthen our country um, and support family reunification. Next slide, please. Um, and this slide offers some guidance on some data or statistics or some concrete examples of how family immigration has strengthened the U.S. So, for example, they've strengthened the U.S. economy, create jobs, um, and call out any kind of points-based proposal that really turns our back on families, um, prolongs family separation, and is diametrically opposed to our, uh, the founding principles and values of why family immigration is so important. We included some statistics 
on families buying homes and starting businesses, um, the, and reiterating that a person's educational attainment is not the sole factor in determining their worth, um, and instead recognizing the inherent value of all people. Um, we also want to uh, make sure our members of Congress know that uh, families are a source of love and support, but also directly contribute to the stability and prosperity um, of communities and making sure that families together can succeed. Um, so for example, um, one partner might offer um, childcare while another partner works, or families might work together to start a business, that kind of thing. Um, next slide, please. So the rest um, of the asks, I am going to move incredibly quickly through. And that's because I want everyone to be aware that the Reuniting Families Act and, and Strengthening Family Immigration is really the top priority ask that we want to deliver to members of Congress and their staff. Um, these other asks are helpful um, to have in mind. And as the conversation progresses, we would love to include these asks in meetings as appropriate. Um, and so you can feel free to read through the specific provisions um, and uh, the details of these slides that contain the key points of the asks as well as supportive talking points. So just to be really brief, um, we have two asks to, for Congress to protect refugee families. The first would be to support the GRACE Act that restores uh, the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program to historic norms by setting a minimum refugee admissions goal of at least 95,000 each fiscal year, which is the average annual admissions goal from 1980 until this administration, and offers Congress more ability to, to exert oversight and accountability over the administration. Similarly, um, we would ask Congress to support the No Ban Act that uh, terminates the refugee, Muslim, and asylum ban and prohibit future discrimination uh, based on country of origin or faith. Next slide, please. And here are some uh, suggested talking points that you can consider when talking about refugee protection and refugee resettlement. Next slide, please. For the protecting vulnerable families and kids through the budget process, we are asking Congress to cut funds for detention, deportation, and border militarization, and to reject any proposal that undermines asylum or child protections, criminally prosecutes immigrants for migration-related offenses, um, or turns to military installations for child or family detention. We also want to make sure Congress is holding the administration accountable for cruel treatment of individuals and families in its custody um, through appropriations, hearings, and legislation, and to divest from, from these harmful provisions and instead invest in community wholeness. Next slide, please. And this slide offers some talking points and some data around how the DHS budget has been blo increasingly bloated over the last several years and why it's important we use our tax dollars for community wholeness and not to separate families, incarcerate families, or conduct mass ice raids. Um, and includes some uh, talking points for how to pivot um, when you get difficult questions. Next slide, please. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't at least flag that one of our asks within the Strengthening Family Immigration section is to co-sponsor the No Federal Funds for Public Charge Act that would defund um, and end the new public charge rule that could become could come into effect um, later this fall. Um, and essentially what it would do is expand who would be considered a public charge and likely result in many family-based visas being denied and keeping families apart. Next slide, please. Um, and these talking points offer some more guidance as to how to talk about this bill. Um, the main thing is that we want to lift up is how many immigrants, if the public charge rule were to take effect, would force families to choose between uh, nutrition, medical, and educational assistance um, against uh, jeopardizing their own immigration status. Uh, and so this is a really false uh, 
cruel choice we shouldn't put anyone through. Next slide, please. Um, don't worry if you didn't memorize all of this. All of this information is contained in a handy participant packet uh, Google folder, which is linked right here and contains sample talking points. All of the handouts we'll be giving to members of Congress, as well as general hill tips for how to deliver these talking points to your members. Um, and so I'm going to hand it um, back over to uh, navigate the hill and offer some tips and best practices. Hey everyone, this is Bessie. I'm with Asian Americans Advancing Justice AAJC. We are scheduling meetings for all of you and you'll receive a schedule next week that will be scheduled for Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning. And your schedule will include information on the date and time of the meeting, the office that you'll be meeting with, the staff member's name, contact information and title, and also the room where your meeting will take place. You will also receive a leave behind folder with materials to leave behind after your meeting. Um, and for each of your meetings, you'll be accompanied by a staff member with Value Our Families and additional adv Advocacy Day participants. For any meetings that we're not able to secure, we encourage drop-bys. You can stop by the office, ask to speak to an immigration staffer, and also leave the Leave Behind folder with the office. In advance of next week, we wanted to go over some tips and best practices for navigating the hill, and we'll also review this more next week. First, every senator and representative has staff who handles different issue areas and has different levels of subject matter expertise. So be patient if you meet with someone who doesn't have the same experience as you do. You might meet with a chief of staff, a legislative director, or a legislative assistant who handles the issue. And staff often make recommendations on how their members should vote and what priorities they take on. So don't be disappointed if you're not meeting with a member. All the staff that we're meeting with are very important and make key decisions. Sometimes you might show up to a building and there's no line, but sometimes you might go and there's a really long line at the entrance. If this is the case, you can walk to the next visitor entrance or go to a connecting building's entrance. The Independent Street and Constitution entrances tend to be the busiest. The easiest way to travel between the House and the Senate buildings is to walk, and it can take up to 20 minutes. So plan ahead and give yourself plenty of time to get between meetings. All of your meetings will be scheduled an hour apart, so there should be enough time for the meeting and also time to get in between the buildings and to find the room where the meeting is taking place. Some security tips. Entering a congressional building can sometimes be like going through security before a flight. There's a list of prohibited items, so please don't bring these. They include pocket knives, guns, mace spray, and lighters. When you enter a building, you'll place your bag, folders, and any items on a conveyor belt. You also have to take everything out of your pockets. What to wear. We recommend dressing in business or business casual clothes. Also, because we'll be doing a lot of walking in between meetings, please wear shoes you can walk in all day and are comfortable. Also, give yourself enough time to get between security lines. We recommend arriving five to 10 minutes early for each meeting and letting the front office staff know when your group has arrived. Um, if you have extra time, you can huddle, collect yourselves, and review your plan for the visit. For each group, meetings will be scheduled at least one hour apart, and each meeting is, in, um, is expected to take approximately 15 to 20 minutes. So some things to keep in mind. Sometimes meetings will take place in a hallway, especially on the house side. And this is because Hill offices are small and there often isn't enough room. This is common and it's not disrespectful. Also, plan to fit everything you have to say, including very clear asks, into 15 to 20 minutes. We'll have time to practice together in small groups on Tuesday and Wednesday morning. Um, during this time, we'll prepare agendas for the meeting, go over roles of each person in the group, and also have time to practice. Also, after the meeting, take pictures in a respectful way, and, and you can post these on social media. Social media is another great way to reach your member. If there is time after the meeting, you can debrief in a separate location outside the office to identify any follow-up items. Follow-up emails to the staff member that you're meeting with is a great way to continue building your relationship. You can reiterate your asks. If there are questions that you weren't able to answer during the meeting, you can follow up with the answers to those questions. You can identify any follow-up items. And if you don't have a relationship with the in-district office, you can ask for an introduction. 
Also, please be sure to fill out the feedback form. So navigating the house office buildings. There are five house office buildings, but most of the meetings will take place in three of the buildings, Cannon, Longworth, and Rayburn. All of these buildings are connected by tunnels, so you don't have to exit and re-enter, and the tunnels are located either on the basement floor or the sub-basement floor. For finding the right room, um, Cannon, all the room numbers have three digits and the first number identifies the floor. For Longworth and Rayburn, all room numbers have four digits and the second number will identify the floor. For navigating the Senate office buildings, there are three buildings that will have meetings in, Dirksen, Russell, and Hart. All of these Senate buildings are connected so you don't need to go outside to exit or re-enter a room or a building. Um, Russell and Dirksen actually connect on the basement floor and Dirksen and Hart connect on nearly every floor. So look for signs. And for finding the right room, all room numbers have three digits and the first number will identify the floor. And I'll turn it over to Grace and Meredith. Thank you so much. Thanks, Buffy. Um, uh, so, so we, <laughs> we wanted to talk ahead, a little Grace. bit about things to avoid. Um, so we just want to make sure that, you know, we wanted to have this webinar to give you all a chance to review some of these policy pieces and to prepare in advance. But it's okay if you get asked a question that you don't know the answer to. You just want to let them know, you know, I don't know the answer to that specific question, but I can look into it and have someone get back to you. And that's a perfectly fine answer. We are going to be making sure that we do really intentional follow-up with each of these um, staffers and members of Congress so that we can continue to build a relationship and hopefully win over all of their support for the Reuniting Families Act and for the rest of our agenda. We also want to avoid being partisan or argumentative in this context. Um, and so, you know, just think about how you can best prepare yourself to communicate in a really clear and calm way so that we're not arguing with staffers, but we can have a respectful discussion that is also persuasive. Also, don't forget to share the leave behind materials with the office. We'll be preparing these really detailed folders with bill numbers and one pagers and everything that the staffer might need. And so we want to make sure to leave that with them. And also don't make long speeches. We want to make sure to be conscientious of time. And as Bessie said, we want to keep these to 15 to 20 minutes. And so both for you know, the sake of making sure that we're able to make all of our asks, we want to keep each individual's piece short. Um, but you also want to be, you know, cognizant of the other members of your group and make sure that, you know, everyone has a chance to share why they're there and, and their and their story. Um, and so, again, when we're in D.C. on Tuesday afternoon, um, we'll be preparing so that you can talk with the other members of your lobby team about who will take on what role and you all can plan that in advance. And then lastly, make sure to thank your members or their staff for their time even if they don't agree with our position, because we want to make sure to build a relationship that's kind of forward looking and we want to come back to them to see if we can persuade them or change their mind in the future. Next slide, please. So working as a team is really important and we'll have time to do some of that team building and getting to know each other on Tuesday when we first meet. Um, and so as a team, you each want to prepare beforehand what you want to present. Again, as I mentioned, we'll be splitting up into different roles so that you can, you know, share your story in one meeting or maybe make the ask in another meeting. Um, and so you all will figure that out amongst your own teams. And you want to think about the different perspectives that each team member brings to the table when you're dividing up those roles so that we can really highlight each um, advocate's strengths. We also want to organize ourselves to best present why that particular elected official should support families. And so we should think about, you know, what their district looks like or which state they're coming from, um, you know, what experiences they might have had with the immigration system. And so we just want to take the time to, um, to really think about why this member of Congress should support our issues and our platform. And we'll have member profiles um, with information about each member of Congress that we're meeting with for you all to review in advance as well. You know, you also want to just make sure to find your rhythm as a group and just figure out how you all can best work together. 
And last but not least, and certainly the most important, is be sure to get the asks in. The asks, right, whether to co-sponsor the Reuniting Families Act or to support one of our other pieces of legislation, those are the most important part of our meetings and of our advocacy days in DC. And so while it's great to connect with the staffer and to share stories, we want to make sure that we get that ask in and that we get a solid answer from them so that we can follow up and move our campaign forward. Next slide. So there are a few different ways that you can prepare yourself kind of mentally or emotionally. Um, and so four, four kind of suggestions are laid out here. One is to visualize just to think about how, how this interaction will go, how the meeting will go, and to envision yourself sharing your story or sharing you know, a different piece of the meeting in the most powerful way. Another option is to try some meditation beforehand, just to clear your mind and to take some deep breaths and center yourself before heading in. And similarly, there are different breathing exercises that you can do to kind of help calm yourself if this is something that you think will um, you know, cause some nervousness. Um, and then lastly, the power pose is one way to kind of get yourself feeling really confident. Um, and so it's a, it's literally a pose where you're put you, your hands up and your head up and you just, you know, assume this power pose for a minute. Um, and I've, tr I've tried it before and it is totally effective and it just makes you feel like you're really ready to go out and do whatever you have to do. So I think that wraps it up for the content that we wanted to present. Um, I realized we didn't pause earlier for questions about the policy pieces. So we'll open it up for any questions that you have, whether it's about navigating the Hill or any of the different policy pieces that we talked about earlier. Um, folks can feel free to use the chat um, or if we can unmute everyone so that so that they can speak up, that would be great as well. I have a question, Grace. Um, in terms of the information about our members of Congress, will we be getting information that is background on whether our members um, are already co-sponsoring a piece of legislation or not? Yes, absolutely. Um, we will be sharing in the member profiles, whether they're um, past co-sponsors of the Reuniting Families Act or whether they've signed on to um, any of the other pieces of legislation in our platform. We think this is a great opportunity to thank any members who have signed on to certain pieces. And so we want to make sure that you go in with that information. Um, that way you don't have to ask somebody who's already a champion on that issue if they'll co-sponsor. We had a question from Cheyenne Cheng. When will we know our groups and who we'll be speaking with? We'll be sharing that information, um, a hard copy next week, but we can send that information via email before, but the schedule might change as we're still confirming meetings. If folks have any other questions in between now and Tuesday when we'll all meet in person, you can feel free to email any of us, any of the three of us, Grace, Meredith, or Bessie. Um, Vivian has also been sharing um, information with all of you via email, and so you can respond to her emails as well, um, and we'll make sure to answer everything that we can in advance of the fly-in. Oh, we have a few additional questions. Is there a strategy for how many asks to make for each member of Congress? And this question is from Tessa Schwann. 
So as Meredith said earlier, our primary focus is the Reuniting Families Act. So we want to make sure to do that first, um, since that's kind of the, the key thing that's bringing us all together. Um, in terms of additional asks, we recommend, um, you know, no more than like two to four at the most, I would say. Again, remember that this is a 15 to 20 minute meeting. And so um, you likely won't have time to talk about everything that you want to discuss. Um, but we also recommend thinking about the people who are in your group um, and the perspectives that are represented there. And so if there's an issue, you know, an issue besides the Reuniting Families Act that's really personal to someone, that someone has a really clear connection to, you know, I think it's great for them to bring that up and to make that ask. Um, but we have the leave behind sheet that outlines all of the legislation that we support as an easy way to let that staffer and that member of Congress know here are the here are the different bills that we support and we're aligned with. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Awesome, because I have a question that I did not know how to work the muting thing. Okay, um, I came a little late into the webinar. Um, can you like, just, I'm a person who needs to like mentally know what's going on and prepare. Like possibly you might have done this earlier, walk through like what the dates will look like um, so that way, that could help me with envisioning and like power stands and um, um, just readiness for the next two days. Absolutely. Are you are you asking for an agenda or a schedule for the days? We have. I have the agenda, but I just like what is it? Because you've done this before, correct? So like, what does it look like? Like kind of like painting a picture for the schedule to kind of like leap off the page. Sure, so this is Meredith. Um, we will be meeting on Tuesday night at the Lutheran Church of Reformation. Um, and so it's like a big parish hall. Um, so imagine a church basement, basically. Um, and it's a big open space. Um, and that's what we'll be gathering um, for the uh, initial training um, as well as the dinner. Um, and is where we'll be doing some team building and a group picture. Um, on Wednesday, we will regather in the morning at the Lutheran Church of the Reformation in the same parish hall, um, where we'll be having um, some breakfast together before we jump into advocacy training part two, um, and then grab our lunches. Um, and so most of the morning will be um, in the church. Um, followed by the afternoon will be the actual lobbying. So uh, it's July in DC, it's pretty hot and humid. So imagine, um, a, a, somewhat of, of an oppressive heat um, to get from the church over to either the house um, or the Senate side. Um, and they're really beautiful historic buildings on the inside. They all look a little bit different. Some um, have uh, some more modern windows and a lot of light and some are a little bit darker um, and have more of that historical feel to them. Um, and so that will be that will be um, the bulk of the afternoon is popping between the different offices. Um, and then dinner and debrief is back in the parish hall um, at the church that evening. Um, and then the following morning on Thursday, um, we'll jump right back into um, the various lobbying activities, back to those Senate and House buildings, um, and then conclude with lunch and next steps at the parish hall in Lutheran Church of the Reformation before we adjourn and head out um, to to the airport. So uh, there will be a lot of time in the Lutheran Church, and there will be a lot of time in the historic House and Senate buildings, and there will be a fair amount of time having to be um, in the outdoor heat. Hopefully it won't be raining um, uh, under the hot sun. Thank you. We have one additional question about when the slides will be emailed out. Um, so we'll send a recording of this webinar and the slides by no later than tomorrow. I don't think we have any additional questions at this time, but if you find that after the webinar you do have a question, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, again, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar and the slides by tomorrow, and we'll be in touch again soon before next week. Looking forward to seeing everyone soon. Thanks for joining us.
Thanks so much for joining us, everyone.